Yes. So um, I'm going to introduce you now, like few other academics in the British Isles, Fiona Sampson has decisively contributed to the hermeneutics, the teaching, the production, if I may say so, and the historization of contemporary poetry in English. Moreover, she is Professor Emerita at the University of Roehampton, where until very recently, she held one of the most influential positions in the teaching of poetry in England. Besides, she has published 29 books and her work has been translated into 38 languages. Her astoundingly prolific writing has been awarded with a number of prestigious prizes, among quite a few others, the renowned Chomley Award. And of course, she has mapped the landscape of contemporary poetry in Britain in her influential study, Beyond the Lyric, published in 2012. Achievements that in themselves merit recognition. At the same time, Fiona Sampson's writing combines academic, poetic, personal, historical, and several other perspectives. Her poem, Schubertia, for example, does not only enchant us by its musicality. In fact, I almost forgot to mention that Fiona Sampson, at the beginning of her career in the arts, excelled as a professional concert pianist, but also by its sensitive and sensual, and thus imaginatively accurate recreation of the romantic composer's working conditions. In turn, Fiona Sampson also applies her poetic imagination to her academic work, namely to her most recent prose publication, Two-Way Mirror, on the life of Elizabeth Barrett Browning, in which she reflects how one of the greatest poets of the Romantic age struggled to overcome misattributions. In fact, Fiona Sampson has acted as an advocate for Barrett Browning in the courts of history, where she pleads that the poet must rather be perceived as a publicly engaged personality against slavery, from which her family's income derived, or against child labor. Hence, she was certainly not the frail damsel that we meet in the paper mache landscapes of literary history. This alone could be regarded as political to the highest degree. But I'm sure there is more we can learn today from Fiona Sampson, Sampson when she bridges two centuries, connecting Percy by Shelley and Elizabeth Barrett Browning with Sean O'Brien and Pauline Steiner. Well, thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, Matthias. Thank you very much for such a generous introduction, but also thank you for the invitation. It's um, a real pleasure to be here, as it were, as well as here. So yes, I am going to talk about those four figures, not all at the same length, you'll be glad to know. Um, and I'm going to start where so much British thought about um, the political life of poetry starts, and that's with Percy Bysshe Shelley and his well-known claim that poets are the unacknowledged legislators of the world. I have to confess that uh, at the university I have recently left, they have rather exasperatingly a modified version of this as a mural um, on the wall of actually of our college, which um, within the university, which says, um, poets are the legislators of the unacknowledged world, which of course is completely to miss the point of what Shelley is saying and to, as it were, use an idiom, sell poetry down the river because everybody believes that poetry poets are legislators of the unacknowledged world um, the question is whether we engage with the acknowledged world too so percy bishelli made that claim exactly two centuries ago in his posthumously published essay a defense of poetry i mean he actually wrote the essay in 1821 which was an altogether headier time for british poets than 2020 is proving to be Verse was arguably the most highly respected of literary genres and was widely read. Although literacy levels were low, of course, poetry's influence among those who did enjoy cultural resources and authority was high, in other words. One way to take Shelley's anachronistic or even fantastical sounding statement seriously today then, is simply to read it as a reminder that culture makers like 19th century poets and their readers help create the social consensus from which, in theory at least, democratic government arises. A broad contemporary example is the way that the airtime and newspaper space surrendered since the millennium to covering the pantomime capers of and falsehoods uttered by the British political establishment's right-wing Europhobes has led willy-nilly to the national tragedy of Brexit. <laughs> 
cultural performance, I have a lowercase c for culture, meaning as I do the ideas and entertainments available in the shared social space, is a form of iteration. And contributing to the chorus of things said helps incrementally to change the character of that shared space. This understanding surely lies behind attempts to orchestrate a social media wall of sound when, for example, progressives find themselves repeatedly tweeting to an audience who need no converting, they're protesting analyses of the latest horrifying governmental misstep. There's also catharsis, of course, but though that principle may also have a literary origin, I'll leave it aside for now. Of course, it's still the case that some increments of change are larger than others. A Times newspaper editorial or a celebrity's tweet exerts more leverage than the latest collection by even our most distinguished poets. And I've lost track of the number of such powerful voices, whether in the national and international news media or from among those ranks of the celebrities who have amplified Amanda Gorman's US presidential inauguration poem as if not understanding that it's the only one that's broken through to them because it's the only one to have been given such a platform. I don't mean that the poem itself, its performance and above all the sentiments it contains aren't exemplary, beautiful political rhetoric calling on the call and response all traditions of particularly black America. They are. But I do mean that these virtues are not what led its huge audience of non-habitual poetry readers and listeners to hear the poem and all it meant. Instead, it was the occasion that did that. The occasion acknowledged and in a sense trumped the poem itself, if you'll pardon the pun. But Shelley, writing at a time when Lord Byron was publishing Don Juan in installments and enjoying, if that's the word, an international reputation of the kind associated in more recent times with rock stardom, wasn't simply talking about the effective contemporary cultural influence of poetry. On the 21st of October, 1821, he wrote to the better known poet about Don Juan that, quote, you are building up a drama such as England has not yet seen. He'd already described it to his wife, Mary, on the 10th of August as, quotes, something wholly new and relative to the age. At the same time, however, in his defense of poetry, Shelley is making a larger claim, not only for this social status and reach of poetry, but for the form's ability to go beyond conventional thinking and so uncover new and profound truths. The entire foundations of such, of ne such neo-philosophical, quasi-metaphysical inquiry into ways of knowing far exceeds the scope of this lecture. The notion of forms of thought having the ability to release but also to imprison empirical revelation arguably underlies the philosophical idealism on which German and eventually British romanticism was founded. Indeed, underlies the whole Western notion of philosophical investigation. But I believe Shelley's claim does offer an interesting model against which to read the intent. And in this I include, of course, the political intent of verse being written even today. It's a model hiding in plain sight, of course. T.S. Eliot's familiar lines in East Coker 5, that poetry performs a raid on the inarticulate, is also a protest against the decay of understanding that cliche produces a vision of linguistic entropy, which is an excuse to read a little bit of East Coker again. So here I am in the middle way, having had 20 years, 20 years largely wasted, the years of l'entre de guerre, trying to learn to use words. And every attempt is a wholly new start and a different kind of failure, because one has only learnt to get the better of words for the thing one no longer has to say or the way in which one is no longer disposed to say it. And so each venture is a new beginning, a raid on the inarticulate with shabby equipment always deteriorating in the general mess of imprecision of feeling, undisciplined squads of emotion. To put it another way, Shelley, by way of Eliot, implies, at least for our purposes today, an argument 
that some poetry has the potential to be political, not in the straightforward sense of declaring political ideas, and so adding to that cultural chorus, but rather by causing the reader or listener to think differently, to have a changed worldview. Not all new thoughts are political, of course, though I have a feeling that all worldviews may be. But certainly political worldviews can number among them. So I want to look at the extent to which such a poetics, the eliciting of change, may be reasonably argued for as political, where it's identified at work in British writing. In other words, I suspect we can identify two poetics of political intention at work in contemporary British poetry. One might be called expository. Here is a political idea or feeling or experience. And the other termed exploratory. What do we find ourselves thinking or feeling politically that we weren't previously aware of? I should add, of course, that my involvement with literary translation suggests to me that these parallel poetics aren't confined to British verse. They're parallel, but not, I suggest, necessarily absolutely distinct. Shelley was himself capable of verse of political occasion, like Sonnet to the Republic of Benevento, or written on hearing the news of the death of Napoleon, not to mention the addictive furies of the Mask of Anarchy and England in 1819, that gloriously overt statement about an old, mad, blind, despised and dying king, princes, the dregs of their dull race who flow through public scorn, mud from a muddy spring, rulers who neither see nor feel nor know, but leech-like to their fainting country, cling till they drop, blind in blood, without a blow, a people starved and stabbed in the untilled field, and so on. But Shelley also wrote verse that asked the reader to participate in shifts of attitude. Naturally, I'd group under this rubric the overt philosophical explorations of him to intellectual beauty and the triumph of life. I think it goes further, though, and in fact gives us an even better example of the exploratory in encompassing his overarching poetic mode of what Hölderlin called the onrushing word and Shelley himself in Ode to the West Wind called Clarion tumult, tameless and swift and proud, the trumpet of a prophecy, the revolutionary force, in other words, of perpetual motion and change, never letting fixity sit, set in. This vision of the highest human life as one spent perpetually seeking and questioning, refusing tradition and habit, was what, far more than any egalitarian belief, drove Shelley, Shelley's anti-conservative anti politics. And um, when I prepared an edition of uh, Shelley's poetry for Faber, I wrote at some length about this in the introduction and I haven't shifted my opinion yet. As you'll realize to some degree, this raises a question about whether the political character of any exploratory poetics must be intentional or may it be accidental something that the poet, as well as the reader, stumbles upon. This sort of halo of implied inadvertence surrounds the work of my main example, Sean O'Brien, the leading poet who's earned a reputation as Britain's poetic conscience, which is to say both that he writes the kind of public necessary poetry that challenges social and political mores, and that in doing so, he reminds a national poetry of its communitarian role. His work is characterized by a fiercely synthesizing clarity. I mean that he yokes together what traditionally resists being so united. In other words, it's a poetics of active process. And this sense of something, idea or apprehension, becoming or emerging in the course of a poem is one of our best clues, I'd suggest, to a poetics of exploration rather than exposition. Tables and Chairs from O'Brien's 2011 collection, November, acknowledges and explores this dialectic between the witnesser and the witnessed. And he's using a quotation from Roy Fuller about 
the innocent walls and light. So in Sean O'Brien's poem, he says, the tables and chairs, the innocent walls and light would be nowhere without us. If we should scrutinize the cracked glaze of a tile left lying on the windowsill and then pass on to emulate the window's wall-eyed stare at ordinary emptiness, a yard, the gate ajar to take us back where we began and see us off the premises, what margin of endurance do you think we'd find between necessity and chance? There are plenty of poetic pleasures here. The illusion in that movement, back where we began, shifted from the manorial garden of Eliot's Burnt Norton to a working class domestic yard. The simultaneous echo and pun in windowsill, windows wall eyed. The glaring A sounds of stare, gate, gan, and indeed chance. O'Brien is also demonstrating his ease with a traditional British gift for transforming the near at hand into poetic material. But he does something more. The library books and railway lines, the garden bonfires and backstreet pubs that fill and colour his poems are neither tropes nor symbols. I would suggest they are, however, in the work of slightly younger contemporaries like Paul Farley where they seem to function as indicators of a kind of social engagement the poems themselves do not actually make. For example, in Farley's aptly titled Establishing Shot from his 2002 collection, Ice Age. A long, slow take, half closing day, no one playing out. A gull mouth chalked on brick is a frame within a frame just for a moment. That the particular local Britishness of this might need footnoting, half closing is the work day on which every week of the year, traditionally, every business in a provincial town would close at lunchtime. Playing out means playing in the street, is half of Farley's surely political point, as is its positioning of the poet narrator as provincial and, since he plays out in the street, working class. There's a tribal note, amplified by a note too of nostalgia, even though this poem appeared before the poet himself had turned 40. That's because it speaks within the still influential legacy of Philip Larkin, who combined tropes of the quintidian with sepia tints and did so consistently in poems as ostensibly various as Mr. Bellini or an Arundel tomb, and indeed, as we now know from his correspondence, was powered by right-wing socio-political nostalgia. It's a tradition gloriously parodied in Bruce Robinson's 1987 film, With Nail and I, in the person of Uncle Monty, who speaks about his lost love, and he says, a cat, rain, vim under the sink, and both bars on but old now. There is no true beauty without decay. And I realise that this requires patriotic cultural footnotes too. Vim is a kind of sif, a cleaning product, and the bar is the heating element on an old fashioned electric fire. But even Larkin manages on occasion to refill these tropes with some symbolic force. Going, going, gone which takes its title from the auctioneer's patter, announces, for the first time, I feel somehow that it isn't going to last, that before I snuff it, the whole boiling will be bricked in, except for the tourist parts. First slum of Europe, a role it won't be hard to win with a cast of crooks and tarts, and that will be England gone. Much as I dislike Larkin, I have to say that the lines are pretty prescient. Um, we can take the patriotic 50s slang, snuff it, the whole boiling, cooks and tarts, on trust, because here comes a famous heart-stopping list. And that will be England gone. The shadows, the meadows, the lanes, the guild halls, the carved choirs, There'll be books, it will linger on in galleries, 
but all that remains for us will be concrete and tires. This is overtly political, an appeal for conservation that can, as usual, be too easily co-opted by conservative politics, as it was when the then conservative prime minister, John Major, in his much derided 1993 vision of the Britain, spoke, vision of Britain, made a speech to the conservative group for Europe. So this is Major on the 22nd of April, 1993, a very similar list. 50 years on from now, Britain will still be the country of long shadows on country grounds, warm beer, invincible green suburbs, dog lovers, and as George Orwell said, old maids bicycling to Holy Communion through the morning mist. Nevertheless, one of the reasons Larkin's list is resonant, even for those of us who don't share his political convictions, is that it's felt a matter of Larkin's own personal taste and longing as much as it is systematically ideological. That his list is unsystematic and draws so much from the historical and the imagined, those shadows and pastoral meadows, reveals how much it is a personal hinterland rather than a material reality. And it shares this hybridization of political ideation with emotion, this use of the whole resource symbol, not with Paul Farley's poetics, but with Sean O'Brien's. O'Brien, who was born in 1952, grew up in the northern shipping and fishing city of Hull, high on the windswept east coast of England. It is, though, also where Philip Larkin spent his working life as the university's librarian. This post-industrial north, a landscape Britain's metropolitan elite seemed to regard as little more than a waste product of 19th century prosperity, is often O'Brien's material. Yet, from the outset, he used that landscape more as a light on his feet thinker in the tradition of W.H. Auden and later the London-based Australian poet Peter Porter than as a local polemicist. O'Brien's books of poetry, I'll quickly rattle through them. Indoor Park, 83, The Frighteners, 87, Boundary Beach, 89, HMS Glasshouse, 91, A Rarity, 93, Ghost Train, 95, the Ideology, 97. Then we have Down River, 2001. Rivers, 2002. A version of Dante's Inferno. The Drowned Book, 2007. Uh, artist Book, Night Train. Then November, 2011. And most recently, The Beautiful Librarians, 2015. Those are worth rattling through those titles because there's a kind of repetition of images of damp, water, something flowing away, sailing away even, a kind of nostalgia already in the titles. It's also a body of work that is by British standards exceptionally large. As well as poetry, O'Brien has published extensively in other genres, fiction, essays, critical work and anthologies, translation, writing for stage and radio. A centerpiece of his critical practice is 1998's The Deregulated Muse, a view of contemporary British poetry that combines authority with polemic. And all the time, he's been developing a distinctive poetic vision of voice. He is above all, and this is telling, I think, in this context, a lyric poet. Characteristically, his verse is loosely blank the distinctively British noise of pentameter, a presiding presence, though not always literally present. This distinctive walking, talking meter makes space for thoughtful exploration. In November, a grief volume about both personal bereavement and the collective loss of post-war social values, the poem, The Citizens, tells us how, I quote, we fear that the fields of blue air at the world's end will be the only court we face. We fear that when we reach the gate alone, there will be neither words nor deeds to answer with. And that plural pronoun, we fear, 
is both a sign that something more than simple confession is going on and a call to collective responsibility. We, the you and I of writer and reader, are the eponymous citizens. This book's musical and conceptual center of gravity is its elegy for O'Brien's mother, who, answering that call to responsibility, quotes, taught the children of the poor for 40 years because it was the decent thing to do. A brand vision in the era of global capital is that we still are what we do, that human life is made collectively, not within society that one might use as a series of convenient facilities, but through society. In an early poem, Eating the Salmon of Knowledge from Tins, and it's a title that again locates every British reader in class knowledge since tinned salmon was the luxury of the lower middle class. He talks about um, fishing in drains in his childhood. The open drains began a long way off as chalky freshets coming off the wolds. But by the time the city had its way, the water, if you glimpsed it, looked as thick as jelly from a tin of Sunday ham. But it was water, so we fished. The drains are buried now, bulldozed down to thin black seams that, when it's wet, climb up to drown the ground again. But in the drought of 1959, they were polio rivers. But in those days, the murderers came from elsewhere. We could read their bad names in the bits of the people that rustled in dusty hedge bottoms. Crime, sex, the smell that wasn't fish. If O'Brien is the transmitter of moral values, he's also the chief contemporary transmitter of the British modernist tradition. Tradition, too, is a collective responsibility. His verse is full of allusions from art to pop culture. And he uses kennings, which have roots in British poetry's Anglo-Saxon history, like public mind for public library. He can also be very funny, a satirist equally of the self's 4am anguish and of the follies of the daylight world. If any British poet today has cultural capital, it's O'Brien. 2007 was the drowned book made him the most garlanded of contemporary British poets. I could read you the whole list of his wards but I won't. You can look them up. Drowned Book, with its markedly European historical perspective, also includes the poet's Ars Poetica, which comes in the poem Blizzard. He says, the world is not a place, but an occasion, first of sin, and then the wish that such self-knowledge may be gratified while snow continues falling, till we learn there will be neither punishment nor grace. This resists the easy lift off into transcendence somewhere beyond the poem, the blizzard, and this actual life in which both occur. Once again, calling the reader to live well in and through the given world. This is an ethical, not to mention existential poetics, which most resembles among poets of the first half of the 19th century, those of Elizabeth Barrett Browning. Like her slightly younger contemporary, Charles Dickens, Barrett Browning understood the social power of persuasive storytelling. The runaway slave at Pilgrim's Point, her still chilling account of rape within slavery, appeared in an American abolitionist publication in 1847. 1843's The Cry of the Children uses equally violent imagery to protest the brutality of indentured child labour. A subplot of Aurora Lee concerning a young woman trafficked into prostitution and the baby she bears as a result condemns neither woman nor child but the practice itself. Common sense in Britain today, but not in the 1850s when the book was written. And though Kazaki Greedy Windows steps back from advocating democratic revolution, Bar Browning returned to its theme of the Italian struggle for independence and unification in the last book published in her lifetime, Poems Before Congress, 
for which she was pilloried in the British press. She had articulated this ethical Ars Poetica at 20 in the preface to her second book, An Essay on Mind. She said, quotes, I am aware how often it has been asserted that poetry is not a proper vehicle for abstract ideas, but we do not deem the imaginative incompatible with the philosophic for the name of Bacon is on our lips. Why then should we expel the argumentative from the limit of the poetic? While we behold in poetry the inspiritings to political feeling, the momentum ere perennius of buried nations, we are loath to believe her unequal to the higher walks of intellect when we behold Quintilian acknowledge the submission due from philosophers to poets and Gibbon declare Homer to be the lawgiver, the theologian, the historian, and the philosopher of the ancients. We are unable to believe it. Poetry, Browning herself says, is the enthusiasm of the understanding. Early introduction to nonconformist Christianity, a heady mixture of rhetoric with belief and the privileging of word over right, helped shape Barrett Browning's writing. It also shaped her notion of the primacy of personal conscience, a notion later consolidated by nightly prayer sessions with her father and, in her late twenties, deep involvement in a congregational chapel in Sidmouth. Her own and her family's shift from cultural to radical observance was not unusual. Her lifetime saw Methodism in particular expand enormously in odds parallel with the high Anglican Oxford movement, not least among a working class newly unsettled by corn law starvation and desperate living and working conditions associated with the industrial revolution. Nonconformist Christianity offered rousing, newly minted hymns and heady sermons. It also recruited for personal Bible study the very same newfound literacy that was making writers like Dickens and Barrett Browning so socially influential. With its emphasis on individual salvation, this in turn echoed contemporary secular fashions for transcendentalism and Emersonian self-reliance. Such advocacy of self-determination made intuitive sense for a poet who was not only largely self-taught as both classicist and writer, but who struggled with illness and familial pressures to shape her own life. It echoes, too, her passionate support for Italian political self-determination. So, the ethical tradition Barrett Browning believed she was reviving entails the notion of an, as it were, applied rather than pure poetics, and so runs counter to the lyric, which we might define not as primarily confessional, as the lyric I too often makes us believe, but as primarily concerned with being its own textual self in much the way that, and not coincidentally, music is primarily concerned to succeed as being its own best thing. The best purely musical experience isn't necessarily the one with the highest stake political programmatic illusions or intellectual title, as we know, but the one where the notes, their instrumentation and their performance works best musically. The lyric I, that distracting signifier, signifies precisely this retraction of responsibility away from application. Lyric music is orchestrated by a number of poetic elements, allusion among them. We've already seen how simple allusion to elements from the world of what's assumed to be shared experience, whether to something historic or contemporary, can be political in intent. One doesn't need a Marxist perspective on the necessarily determining nature of material experience to observe that any such allusion to it may betray or create political bias. Poetry is a value laden discourse and we read the world of a poem just as much as we read the elements in an individual's life and interests as crystallizing those values. This is obviously true of expository political poems, the kind that as the successors to, say, Shelley's The Mask of Anarchy, that are the successors to say, Shelley's The Mask of Anarchy, and which demand of all of us as readers that we agree as if we didn't already. 
with their standpoints. But it's true too of exploratory poetics, the kind that recalibrate the reader's understanding. And it's true also, since poetry is then something the text itself does, of poems which reveal political insights, whether or not the poet intended this. Pauline Stainer's poems of mourning for her daughter in Crossing the Snow Line, a 2008 collection, take so for granted certain political beliefs that those beliefs serve simply as metaphors. In The Convoy, no angels intervene or lift her daughter to safety, though the poem hears their possibility beyond the workaday exercises of a foreign military power that Stainer observes. Quotes, not the profound machinery of gods, but military vehicles coming from great distance, headlights scenting the sandstorm. This is the first of three stanzas of equal length. The poem, like all Stainer's work, is miniaturized. In fact, it's on what we might call a feminine scale and all women write knowing the scale to which they are expected to write. Even though, like the tanks themselves, Stainer's poem is covering a great distance. And even though, particularly with that synesthetic image of the lights, the headlights as scenting the cloud of sand through which they appear, it leaks beyond the narrow confines of what we first think it says. Nevertheless, that we always already, as they say, both know the underfoot rumble of tanks and deplore the violence they imply, is an assumption that is structural to the poem. A similar shared convention that the 19th century Scottish Highland clearances of ordinary inhabitants off the estates of landowners in order to create recreational game shooting moors was a social abomination, is equally structural to the yet smaller poem, Quandle, from the same collection. I'm going to quote it in its entirety. And it's two, four, six, eight, it's nine lines long. Clearances, the turf a singing green, downwind of the deserted crofts, an owl releasing its third eyelid against the sleet, opaque as history. That the shared understanding is structural holds true even as Stainer uses it as something to turn upon and turn the poem upon. After all, how can we understand how it was since history is opaque as sleet or as the owl's gauzy white nictating third eyelid. Incidentally, I think that one of the things that, poet, that Stainer also does deliberately is insert that tremendous silence around her very short lines as if to build the act of listening, the act of extra attention into her poetry. So it's a kind of hyper awareness Poetry knows what it's doing, I often tell students, even when it appears not to. And poetry that is politically value laden is laden with those values. It is not inadvertent when a woman poet chooses to write small, like Stainer, or indeed to write large, as Elizabeth Barrett Browning did in Aurora Lee. This is a political point about gender in just the way that a poet of black British heritage makes a political point, both when they choose to write in forms which come primarily out of black cultural heritage, as Amanda Gorman did in her inaugural poem, and when they write like the Scots Macar or national poet Jackie Kay in forms with a predominantly white European history. Jackie Kay is also a black poet. Gender and ethnicity are particular examples of situated experiences that have traditionally produced 
politicized poetic articulations that go largely unnoticed by audiences beyond those same groups in society. I sometimes think that sexuality, or at least gay male sexuality, whether in the many fine English translations of Cavafy or in the poetry of Tom Gunn or now Andrew Macmillan, has a history of doing somewhat better, perhaps if only because its themes are instantly recognisable and made explicit. In my own experience, writing poetry that includes philosophical tropes is, as a woman, simultaneously considered unsuitable and apolitical. When, of course, the view that it's unsuitable is precisely what makes it a political act for a woman poet to write on such themes. Relatedly, eco poetry is rarely recognized as such unless it adopts thundering polemic and or is written by a man. Again, my own experience is the assumption that a man is writing eco poetry, but a woman is writing descriptive nature verse. All of this is leading us towards a complex discussion of agency, poetic and textual, for which we, you'll be glad to know, have neither space nor time. But I hope it also leads us towards a reading, listening practice that keeps in mind just how political, in the sense of conscious, legible and intentional political ideas, texts that we find value laden are and that we can enlarge our sense of politically informed poetics to include the apparently artless and the exploratory alongside the expository and didactic. Not least because exposition and didacticism on any subject so often produces inferior verse. As Emily Dickinson knew, success in circuit lies. Thank you. Yeah. Well, um, thank you very much, uh, Fiona Sampson, for this absolutely splendid and formidable lecture. Uh, it was quite stunning.